Hello, Asian patrons of the Vatican Museums, and welcome to our second lecture on the world of Raphael and his world, sponsored by Ben Chang and the Asian patrons of the Vatican Museums. This is part of a four-part lecture series talking about the life of Raphael, the people who influenced him, all in relation to the works of art that are in the Vatican Museums. And today we're talking about the last five years of Raphael's life, Raphael Triomphans, Raphael Morians, the triumphant Raphael, who after the tremendous clash of the Titans, which we spoke about in the previous lecture, finds himself now the undisputed ruler of painting in Rome. He was very, very successful by the time he finished the first two stanze for Pope Julius II. He was now running the, event, the equivalent of a Fortune 500 studio. He had 50 people working for him, something that was unheard of in the Renaissance. He had made friends with the most extraordinary people. He counted among his contacts some of the greatest thinkers of the age, popes and princes. And suitable to his new status, he bought himself a new house in a very prestigious neighborhood, the Borgo, right outside the area of St. Peter's. The road and his house no longer exist. They were destroyed in the early 1900s to make way for the Via della Conciliazione. But Raphael's extremely prestigious house was meant to put forth his new status as a gentleman artist. The Palazzo Caponi, as it was called, was begun by Bramante, and then Raphael completed it when he moved in. But despite all of his successes, coming from being a relatively poor boy from a mediocre painter's studio in Urbino to a palace-owning semi-nobleman in Rome, Raphael was universally acclaimed as an all-around nice guy. Now, one of the biggest changes in Raphael's life was the change in pontificate that happened in the last year of, of painting the stanze. When he was working in 1513 in the stanze del Iliodoro, Pope Julius II died. He was then, the new pope elected was Leo X Medici. Now, even though Julius II was the man who gave Raphael his big break, he was the one who saw the potential in a 25-year-old to paint that famous Stanza della Segnatura, it was Leo X Medici who really allowed Raphael's career to take off. Leo X Medici, interestingly, was exactly the same age as Michelangelo. And to make this point, Leo X's real name was Giovanni de' Medici. His father was Lorenzo the Magnificent, de facto ruler of, ruler of Florence, an art patron extraordinaire, and in our story, also the man who discovered 15-year-old Michelangelo and first got him sculpting. So we have a 15-year-old Michelangelo way back when who moved into the house of Giovanni de' Medici. And I personally think that there wasn't good blood between them, but what I can tell you for sure is that one of the first acts of Leo X was to send Michelangelo back to Florence to do things, to do, to do jobs for the Medici family, leaving Raphael a perfectly clear playing field in Rome. One of the first things Raphael had to complete was the last of the stanze, or one of the last stanze for these Vatican apartments. However, Leo X changed the program and what he was looking for were stories about popes named Leo. He had made a very careful choice in his name for the papacy because there was a long line of extraordinary popes named Leo who had done wonderful things for the city of Rome and beyond. And so in this painting, we see at the coronation of Charlemagne, Raphael showing the scene of uh, Pope Leo crowning the first Holy Roman Emperor on December 25th of, eight, of 800. Uh, the, the lineup of bishops and cardinals. What we really see in this painting, however, is the kind of company Raphael is keeping. You see in the, mo in the, in the corner where we have the Pope crowning the emperor, the Pope's portrait is actually that of Leo X and the emperor's portrait is Francis I of France. And so we look at a Raphael who is now 
doing a portrait of these people who actually met in the Vatican. So we see Raphael included in the highest possible level meeting between the Pope and the King, and then been producing this portrait of them in this, in this painting. And what is particularly interesting is that Raphael very positively impressed Francis I to the point where the King of France had two paintings sent to him by Raphael. One is the King's Madonna, which you see here, and the other one is the Saint Michael defeating the Archangel. So Raphael's fame started to move beyond the borders of Italy and out throughout Europe to the point where he had his works hanging in the Palace of Kings. The second painting of the fire of the Borgo is a particularly interesting one because we see the, 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 the rivalry between Michelangelo and Raphael continuing. Now, last week we talked about the rivalry in terms of Michelangelo sculptor versus Raphael painter, Michelangelo loner versus Raphael gregarious guy. We now look at the question of Michelangelo and Raphael's rivalry in a different light. Raphael took that rivalry beyond the personal, beyond the immediate, and he looked at it as a balancing of two styles of art that have been relating to each other since antiquity. So the painting shows the fire in the Borgo, a ninth century fire that was put out by Leo IV by miraculously blessing it. And so he sets the scene with the old St. Peter's in the deep distance. That's what St. Peter's looked like before Bramante tore it down to build the new one in 1506. On the left-hand side of the painting, we see a very particular type of style. It's marked by the column, the column with the, with the leaves and the volutes. That's called the Corinthian. I'm sorry, it's called the composite. It was invented by the Romans, and it's a kind of over-the-top, very luscious type of column decoration. It's a little bit too much decoration at the top. It's a little bit too florid. It's very beautiful, but it's definitely more on the Baroque side, let's say, of ancient architecture. And the, the type of art that that represents is the Hellenistic. And you see on the left and the right, you see, on, you see on the left several figures that are also Hellenistic. The ultimate Hellenistic sculpture had been rediscovered during the reign of Pope Julius II, the Laocoon, which is kept in the Belvedere courtyard. And so the Laocoon shows the scene of the Trojan priest of the Trojan War flexing that one last time as he tries to shake off these two sea serpents sent by the Greek gods to kill him. And if you you look at that intense musculature of Laocoon and look at the figure hanging off the walls and you see this relationship between this very high octane type of drawing the, 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 that Michelangelo likes. The, the Laocoon was really the principal in, the font of inspiration for Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel. And so we see Raphael looking at Michelangelo's style, not just in terms of Michelangelo, but in terms of a man who fosters the Hellenistic style, a style that comes from antiquity. On the far left-hand side, there's an even more direct allusion. The young man carrying the older man out is an allusion to the story of Aeneas and Anchises. And the two stories fit together. After Laocoon is killed by the sea serpents in Troy, the Trojans brought the giant wooden horse into the city. The Greeks came out of the horse, destroyed Troy. You see the burning city in the background. Aeneas carried his father out of the burning city and eventually Aeneas and his son will make their way to Rome. So we see this whole Roman Hellenistic high octane type of art. Whereas on the opposite side, Raphael chooses to show a, his own style, which is classical. Raphael's affinity is with the classical art. As a matter of fact, the columns behind the women who are bringing the water and the fire in the Borgo are Ionic, one of the two oldest forms of columns, the Doric and the Ionic, much more elegant, much more contained, much more controlled. The statue on the left is a fourth century uh, it was a second century copy of a fourth century original by Leo Caris. He's called the Apollo Belvedere. And that st statue is the paradigm or the epitome of classical art, understated, elegant, 
completely restrained. As a matter of fact, that statue is the inspiration for the female figure with the jug on her head over here on the right. As seen from the back, you can see that they are remarkably similar. Raphael considers himself the great proponent of classical art, Michelangelo of Hellenistic art. And in many ways, it's a way of talking about how tastes are different, but there are actually room for both styles in the history of art. But the rivalry with Michelangelo wasn't quite over for Raphael. Leo X gave another project to Raphael, which would require a direct confrontation with the art of Michelangelo. This is the Sistine Chapel, uh, shown decorated for a holiday or for a, for a service. And along the sides, you can see that the spaces are filled. And the spaces are filled with tapestries, tapestries designed by Raphael under the commission of Leo X, something that took place between 1516 and 1519. To, to, in the original Sistine Chapel, uh, it, was, uh, it was decorated with low, with false painted drapery along the side walls. Raphael's job was to produce tapestries that would cover the, the false painted drapery dating from the 15th century. And the tapestries were to show the stories of St. Peter and St. Paul. One of the most wonderful ways the Vatican kicked off the celebration of the death, 500th anniversary of the death of Raphael was to bring those tapestries back to the Sistine Chapel, an extraordinarily rare occurrence, and indeed something Raphael himself never saw. Raphael died before all the tapestries arrived from Belgium, and so he never saw what we saw last February, or indeed what you are seeing in this picture. Now, tapestry design required that Raphael learn a whole new technique. So Raphael had to compete with the extraordinary, extraordinary ceiling decoration you see here in a medium that he was not familiar with. In order to produce tapestries, he would first have to produce a series of drawings. And together with his students, he produced the drawings that would be the models for tapestries to be woven in Belgium. Now, obviously, to do something this big, Raphael relied on the assistance of his studio, but this particular tapestry, the calling of the first two apostles or uh, the uh, miraculous draft of fishes, this particular image is, is, is universally believed to have been designed by Raphael himself. In order to produce this tapestry, Raphael had to, first of all, produce a drawing the same size as the finished product. The cartoons that go to Belgium are exactly the same size as the finished tapestries. In tapestries, you have to decorate all of the space. It's required to fill up all the space with some kind of decoration so that you don't have large blank spaces. And the other thing is the expectation of an Italian in tapestry weaving, why you would get an Italian to do the drawing, is because Italians are extraordinary storytellers in their composition. The art of draftsmanship, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about Leonardo, is the art of being able to put figures together in such a way to tell a story. The most complicated thing about drawing tapestries is that you have to make tapestries, draft tapestry cartoons in mirror image. So here is the cartoon that Raphael produced. And you can see that in order for the tapestry weavers who are working from the back of the tapestry to get the correct direction, he had to produce everything in mirror image. So the story starts here, in the, um, in the drawing on the right hand side and moves its way to Jesus on the left, who has to be blessing with his left hand so that on the finished product, the story will start on the left, finish on the right, and Jesus will raise his right hand in blessing. But the most brilliant thing about this, and this is really what makes Raphael one of the greatest artists of all time, is the way he takes these six figures and he relates them together so as to tell us the story. The miraculous draft of fishes begins with Peter and Paul, Peter, Peter and Andrew, James and John out on boats, not catching fish. And so you see a figure on the far left, which is recognizable to Romans as a river statue. We have dozens of these. So it starts out in kind of a blah way. Then in the gospel story, 
a man, Jesus, stands at the edge of the water and asks them to take him out, take, take, asks the fishermen to take him out in the boat so he can address the crowds better. You can see the crowds on the left hand side. And then there's a little bump that two figures that lift up, pulling the net out. They make the little bump. And that is the beginning of our story. It was a dull day. A man approaches. He, they take him out on the boat. The man tells them to lower their nets. And they lower their nets and they pull up so many fish, the boat is in danger of falling over. At which point, Peter and Andrew rush to the man and say, you should get away from us. You're obviously a great prophet. We're just fishermen. And Jesus replies, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. And so that halfway point in the painting, it goes from that sort of doldrum day to high octane excitement. The first figure of Andrew with his arms open, the second figure of Peter with his hands clasped on his knees, and Jesus who absorbs all the energy of the story. He gives finality of the story as he brings them all in and sends them off on their new mission. The other really extraordinary thing Raphael thought of was again to exploit this extremely fine weaving. These tapestries are woven in the studio of Peter van Elst in Belgium. And so these weavers are so there, they work in gold, silver, and silk threads, and they weave such fine, such fine warps that they, they added the addition of the faces that reflected in the water. So this incredible fine, fine, fine workmanship translated from Raphael's drawing into the actual tapestry. The tapestries were a tremendous success and the drawings really secured Raphael's fame all over Europe. The drawings were not destroyed, they're in the v &A in London because they were recognized as such extraordinary tools for learning for future artists. Now, Raphael's responsibilities became, they became a bit of an avalanche. Uh, Leo X seemed to see Raphael fit for everything. And so in this image, we see Raphael, uh, Bramante, and Michelangelo being charged by Pope Julius II to rebuild the Vatican. Well, in 1514, Michelangelo was gone, and in 1514, Bramante died while still working on St. Peter's. He had just essentially destroyed the old church with a plan to build a new church that was going to be extraordinary. It was going to be the dome of the Pantheon sitting on top of the Basilica of Maxentius, the largest building in the forum, the largest dome in the world, fused together to make this Greek cross plan of incredible complexity and extraordinary beauty. But, but Bramante died in 1514, not leaving much more than that plan. And Leo X appointed Raphael as the new head architect of a project that was so complicated, nobody would know what to do with it for another 30 years until it was handed off to Michelangelo in 1545. Raphael uh, took the project but was unable to work on the level that Bramante did and so he took down the project making it into something a little bit more conservative, a little bit more familiar and this is his plan for St. Peter's which of course was never finished because of Raphael's own untimely death. But he did continue trying to work in architecture with a terrific job given him again by Leo X to produce a a loggia, a loggia, an open arcade. So it's a it's an open arcade which links a number of rooms of the papal apartments. So the Pope would be able to go from one room to the other. He'd be able to get some fresh air because on the right hand side it didn't even have windows. It was all an open area. They could go from the he could take the fresh air, uh, be very close to his apartments, pray, meditate, read a breviary. And so the 13 bays of this loggia were decorated with, with, with the stories of the Bible. And so the Pope would walk through 12 bays of the Old Testament, then down to the one bay of the New Testament and back up. In order to produce something like this, Raphael really had to get a studio formed, going with a lot of people with separate talents. And out of that studio came very innovative ideas of painting. Raphael was the kind of art, kind of employer, the kind of um, a leader 
who inspired all the other people around him. So in this first one, we see uh, an image of the Jacob's dream, where we see a kind of riff on what Michelangelo is doing. Jacob on the bottom is sort of reclining the way Adam is in the creation of woman, and God is violently foreshortened, kind of flying out as if he's coming towards you. But those rich, rich, dark clouds, something that doesn't appear in the art of Michelangelo, open to create this brilliant, flame-like stairway with the angels going up and going down. So kind of playing with Michelangelo's sculptural figures to anchor the scene and then adding all these sort of interesting touches that are more atmospheric. He also employed people who would start the new, what would become the fad of landscape painting. So as we see Moses being pulled from the reeds, the group of women in the foreground really are a small part of a painting that show this extensive river. You see the river leading all the way back to the city, the light reflecting off the water, the effect of the foliage. This kind of art will blossom into landscape art and will be particularly explored by basically descendants of the studio, the students of the people who did this in tremendous projects like the Scala Sancta near St. John Lateran. Raphael's atelier uh, was a very special place. Instead of just being there to raise up Raphael's name and to make Raphael famous, Raphael was one who encouraged the best out of all of his students. And many, many, many of the greatest names of the re re Renaissance, late Renaissance, come out of this studio. Here you see Perrine de la Vaga, who will be the man who decorates most of Castel Sant'Angelo for Pope Paul III. This extraordinary figure down here is Giovanni da Udine. And Giovanni da Udine spent many, many years studying ancient Roman ruins, such as the Domus Aurea, the Golden House of Nero. There he applied himself to learning the stucco technique that produced the lovely raised decorations in these ancient sites. And it was Giovanni da Udine who figured out how the Romans mixed plaster marble dust water in order to make stucco identical to the ancient Roman type. And so you see the stucco medallion made by Giulio uh, Giovanni da Udine, which shows Raphael and his studio at work. Not a portrait of just the artist in the loggia, but a portrait of the whole studio, the teamwork, the ensemble cast that made this, this loggia possible. And the most famous of Raphael's studio, uh, students was Giulio Romano, who followed in his master's footsteps so much that he moved to Mantova. He built himself a gentleman house and was so successful. You see him here dabbling in architecture. And he was so successful that he was able to have his portrait done, of all things, by none other than Titian, one of the most famous artists in the world in the day. Here is the finished product, the uh, one of the bays, uh, the bay that shows the stories of David. And you can see on the right, the stucco decoration developed by Giovanni da Udine. You can see on the left, this kind of airy blue sky with doves and garlands. So creating the effect of nature, you look outside on, uh, on the right-hand side and you could look at something that looked like another window on the left-hand side. An architectural framework creating this beautiful door uh, a structure to hold the paintings together and then these four beautiful little panels that look like little jeweled illuminations and this is again speaks to this again speaks to the patronage of Leo X. Julius II was a visionary patron, a brilliant patron, but lay it a bit but Leo, Leo X had a very particular eye. Leo X being a Medici, had a very refined type of patronage, a patronage that required many different hands on the job. Only Leo X could have commissioned tapestries because only the Medicis would have had business interests, interests in Belgium that allowed the tapestries to be, be drawn in Rome and then produced in Belgium. And only Leo X would have come up with the idea of decorating an entire hallway with these almost miniature Bible stories because Leo X had a tremendous love of miniatures. And indeed in the portrait that was being executed at the same time by Raphael of Leo X, you see this very refined Pope in his silk 
a robe lined with fur. It's a quilted silk robe lined with fur, holding a magnifying glass as he studies what? The miniature images, the scenes, the tiny biblical scenes of the Hamilton Bible. Even the fine chasing on the bell shows a man who is very attentive to, sensitive to, and appreciative of the very, very, very fine details of beautiful things. Raphael's change, Raphael's transformation uh, also involved this gentleman artist becoming a kind of public intellectual. So Raphael was given a very significant job by Leo X. The job was conservator of antiquities. So now Raphael is moving out of the craftsman stage of the painter of the decorator of the apartments or the designer of the tapestries. And now his job is a, is a, is a studious job, that of looking at all the remnants of ancient marbles that are left in the city of Rome. Can you imagine how many of those are? And making decisions about their value, which one should be conserved, how they should be conserved. And as he was thinking about this, all of these monuments left in the city of Rome, he began to think about a sort of overarching need for a catalog. His plan was to try to create a map of the antiquities of ancient Rome by, by region, by region of region, the 14 regions of ancient Rome, putting the each one of the antiquities in its proper place. And as he developed this idea of the importance of conservation, he wanted to express his ideas in writing so they would be there in posterity. His paintings would be there, but he wanted his thoughts to be kept alive too. But Raphael didn't have much more than an elementary school of education, so Raphael would not be able to write the kind of letter, express himself in the kind of language that would be expected in papal court. So he turned to a friend, a fellow Urbinite, whose name was Baldessari uh, Castiglione, one of the most cultured men of the entire Renaissance era. This portrait, which Raphael did of Baldessari Castiglione, is, in my opinion, uh, one of his greatest portraits. And it's done with such, uh, a, such, a, such a limited palette. These are topes and beiges and browns. It makes a beautiful yet simple setting for the figure. The luxuriousness comes not from the shiny bright colors or gold chasing or a lot of very obvious fabric details. It's just the change in the materials. So the fur we have around the sleeves, the spray of white linen, the velvet incorporated in the hat, the wool. This is what brings together these subtle changes in texture, creating a cornice for that face with those piercing, steady blue eyes looking out at you. It's tremendously, again, in my opinion, I think it's the most beautiful portrait he ever produced. And Baldessari Peruzzi, very kind man, very, very taken with Raphael. He helped Raphael by writing out the letter for him. And on the right, you see the original letter penned by Baldessari Castiglione back in 15, 15, 15, 16. This letter was lost until 1910, and it's only been recently rediscovered. And the letter reads in one of the more, it's about three pages long, and it says, Raphael wants to express, I think I have managed to acquire a certain understanding of ancient architecture. So here's Raphael with all of the other things he's doing, studying, studying, studying the architecture of the ancients. This is something that gives me at once enormous pleasure from the intellectual appreciation of so excellent a manner. So again, Raphael presenting himself as an intellectual. But it also brings him grief. And this is where his mission will come in. The sight of what you would almost call the corpse of this great noble city, once queen of the world, so cruelly butchered. And he refers to all of the monuments that have been fallen, all of the marbles carved with epigrams or, or, or decorated with reliefs that have just been willy-nilly thrown into furnaces and destroyed to make lime to make new buildings. And so Raphael began this program together with Leo X to try to preserve these ancient works of art. So what I'm really telling you is that Raphael was a charter member of the patrons of the Vatican Museums, his first person work to try to conserve and protect as much of the art and, and testimony from the ancient world as possible. Raphael was unafraid of new technology. 
So where right now in 2020, many of us are trying to figure out Zoom for the first time with a certain amount of trepidation. Raphael was a young man and he saw technology as the great wave of the future. The printing press had certainly been around for 60 years by the time uh, Raphael showed up in Rome, and the printing press had already shown the possibility of how to move words, ideas, exp how people could express themselves and share their ideas through these pamphlets, through these books, the Bible itself, throughout Europe. But it didn't take long for artists to realize if you could share words, you could share pictures. And so, for example, Lucas, Lucas Cranach the Elder, tremendously successful uh, uh, Renaissance German artist, realized the potential of this medium and did many, many of these engravings that could be vastly circulated, and his, his catapulted him to fame. His most famous uh, woodcuts or etchings like this that were um, circulated, unfortunately, are a series of anti-papal cartoons, but the fact of the matter is it showed the potential of this new medium of being able to mass produce words, you could also mass produce images. And Raphael seized that opportunity going into business with Marc Antonio Raimondi. And the two of them produced these drawings. Raphael did the drawings, Marc Antonio did the engravings, and Raphael illustrated for the most part Greek myths. So these wonderful stories, you imagine the stories of Pluto and Persephone, Apollo and Daphne. In this case, this is the judgment of Paris, which will start the Trojan War. You read these stories and then you would have these ex beautiful, exquisite engravings by Raphael, filled with details, the shading, the, the, the composition that you would be able to look at. And so Raphael, again, his fame grew and his wealth grew, becoming increasingly successful as he started up the secondary business in producing these engraved images. But that didn't stop him from taking on new challenges. There was one room left in the apartments of Julius II. So of the suite of four rooms, Raphael had painted three. And as it got to be about 1518, 1519, Raphael started to turn his attention to the last room. The last room was particularly challenging because the walls are twice as long as the other, as the other rooms. And so to try to create a painting, a mural painting, that would occupy the entire length of the room is a question of composition, which is like the choreography of a giant musical on a Holly on a Broadway stage. And so Raphael wanted to try to tell the stories of Constantine challenging himself to incorporate hundreds of figures in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, as opposed to the 60 figures he had done in the School of Athens. Now Raphael is going to triple, quadruple the number of figures that he's placing into his, into his paintings. And it requires a tremendous amount of choreography, organization, composition to make the story flow and not have the key figures get lost. So this drawing eventually became Came. It was completed after his death, but eventually became the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And this brings me to uh, the project that we're going to be talking about today. We talked about uh, the, the project of the cleaning or the restoration of the room of Constantine, including this Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And you will find on the patron's website a video made especially for the patrons with Father Kevin Lixey, the International Director of the Patrons of the Vatican Museums, and none other than the Director of the Vatican Museums herself, Barbara Yatta, who for the patrons personally unveiled the new restoration. And you'll see the video put together by Martina from the patron's office to beautiful music as the first, you see the first unveiling of this very long, five year long restoration and the amazing colors and the amazing things that have come forth. So I, I, I beg you, uh, make sure you take a look at the short video, it's about four or five minutes long, to see this painting in all of its restored glory. Raphael's uh, success, of course, 
led him to start moving with a very fast crowd. And so from the halls of the Vatican, he moved out to the pleasure palace of Agostino Chigi. Agostino Chigi was considered the wealthy, wealthiest man in all of Christendom. There was no question about it. Uh, between monopolies on alum for dyeing cloths, to being the bankers, to popes and princes, uh, the Kijis had done extremely well for themselves. And Agostino Kiji lived a pretty kind of interesting, fast and loose, loose lifestyle. As a matter of fact, uh, there were scandal rags in the uh, 16th century, and Agostino Kiji did his fair share of work to fill them. And so the pleasure palace that he constructed in 1515 along the banks of the Tiber, known as the today known as the Farnesina, uh, was a palace which he built for his own amusement, the first suburban villa to be built in Rome since antiquity. He hired, for Agostino Chigi, Raphael and his studio to paint the interior of his villa with love stories, which was very appropriate given this fact that this man had been brought in and out of his house, the most famous courtesans in Rome, Imperia, who was the most famous courtesan in Rome, had been in and out of that house. Uh, he threw parties where, where noblemen would throw silver, the silver plate off their, off their plates onto the, uh, into the river. And this was a place of tremendous uh, 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 high life and fast living. So Raphael started work for Agostino Chigi, and in that environment, he painted something really quite extraordinary. The image of the Galatea, which was done by Raphael's own hand in the left loggia of the, uh, of the building, uh, shows the story of the nymph Galatea, it's told to us by Ovid, who is um, on her way to see her lover, Achis. She's so beautiful that she has broken two hearts, Achis, who is her young lover, and the, the Cyclops, Polyphemus. Polyphemus is a dreadful creature, lives in Sicily, uh, herds goats, gigantic monster, one eye in the middle of his head, generally all around unpleasant person. But seduced by the beauty of Galatea, he changes and he learns to comb his craggy beard. He cuts his hair and he starts to compose poetry to Galatea. So this taming of the monster by the beauty of Galatea, and he composes these songs to her as she rides along the waves. And Raphael captures this beauty as she turns her head back to listen dreamily to the music, the homage paid to her by the Cyclops, all the while rushing off to the right, we are presuming to her lover. He frames this golden moment, the ultimate, the ultimate figure of desire, the three little cupids on the top, these wonderful little mm, mm, cavorting figures underneath, and that stunning image of Galatea, dynamic yet still at the same time. And I think this, is, this work was actually so, uh, so successful that Raphael found himself uh, at parties with people coming up asking, did you use a model for that Galatea? And um, if you did, could I, could I get her number? She was so beautiful, people wanted to meet her. And Raphael's answer, which is a legend in the history of art, was, oh no, I never found a woman that beautiful. So she was just a little idea I had. And I think it's very important to realize what Raphael is telling you here. Raphael can create beauty in his mind. He can imagine beauty. And then with his hands, he can transmit that beauty onto a wall. And that beauty is so powerful, it attracts others. It's the ultimate way of claiming the intellectual role of the artist. Because where there was nothing as beautiful as what he wanted, he was able to make it. And then he was able to make other people see and share in it. So at this exact moment in Raphael's life, however, he's torn between, I think, two different, two different directions. And this is a little bit more of my own personal speculation, but I, 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 I've spent quite a few years thinking about this. And I noticed this sort of the key to what I'm thinking about are in these two paintings. You see a Raphael who is extraordinarily wealthy. He's hanging around with the wealthiest man in the world who loves to have courtesans, parties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Raphael, young man, loves his parties, loves a good time, loves drinking, loves having fun. But at the same time, he does live in Rome. He spends most of his time in papal court. And I think at a certain point, Raphael began to ask himself, what is, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? 
he must have been about 33 years old. This is the same age that Alexander the Great was when he said he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. And of course, the same age that Jesus was when he died and resurrected. But I think Raphael at some point started to ask himself, what is it all for? And so you see these two female figures who are basically paralleling each other. The Galatea rushing to her love, listening to this other besotted Cyclops. And on the other side, you see St. Catherine of Siena, uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria, essentially in the same position. Both are ex exceptionally beautiful figures. Both were, obviously she's a princess of the, of the, of the dryads, and Catherine of Alexandria was a princess of her own. Galatea convinces the, the, the Cyclops to tame himself and fall in love. It's Catherine of Alexandria, patron saint of philosophy, convinces 50 philosophers in Alexandria to convert to Christianity and to show their love of Christ by, by being martyred. And so you see this is the, 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 the two figures, they have these parallels of beauty, of, of persuasion, of, of wealth, but where Galatea seeks earthly pleasures, Catherine of Alexandria gazes upwards. She gazes towards the heavens and her love, her finality is so strong that she's leaning upon the wheel, which is one of the instruments of her martyrdom. So I think Raphael began to be caught in a, in a, in a, in a self-analyzing question about is he to give himself over to worldly pleasures or is he to dedicate his talents and his life to the love of God? And he continues to explore this, and particularly interestingly, he, he explores this through the question of chastity, this um, Catherine of Alexandria is a virgin martyr, as is Saint Cecilia. Um, Saint Cecilia is, uh, was martyred in Rome. She's a third century AD martyr who, uh, converting to Christianity, was slated to marry a Roman, a Roman aristocrat. She married him on the condition that he convert to Christianity and that they would live like brother and sister because she wanted to dedicate herself entirely to Christ. She was martyred. Her husband's martyr was martyred. Her husband's brother was martyred. But the fact is that she remains the patron saint of music, among other things because in the story of her passion, the, she, the, the, the author tells us that while the drums and the, and the, and the, this is the Marc Antonio version of, um, the Marc Antonio Ramondi version of the, of the work, while the drums and the, and, the, and the cymbals and the pipes played, you know, the kind of music to get your blood boiling for the wedding night, while that music played, all she heard was the choruses of the angels in heaven. So that's why actually Santa Cecilia is the patron saint of music. The composition that Raphael created around this figure is quite remarkable, five standing figures, beautifully arranged so that each one has a slightly different attitude. And that, thanks to Marc Antonio Ramondi, traveled all over the place and became a new style for composing altarpieces. This altarpiece had been commissioned by a woman in Bologna whose name was Elena Dugliol. She herself uh, had uh, lived much like Santa Cecilia, married to a Bolognese nobleman. She too asked him to live like brother and sister. And so she had a particular devotion to Santa Cecilia and actually had a the relic of her knuckle bone. But the point I'm trying to make is that Cecilia represents not only this figure of chastity, which you'll see is important in a moment, but also the ability to leave behind worldly, so that in musical instruments, things that only last for a moment, you play the violin, it's beautiful, you stop playing the violin, the music's gone, and instead be able to concentrate, look at Cecilia focusing upwards on heavenly things. So we see Raphael kind of caught himself personally in this, in this, in this dichotomy. And Raphael had good reason to be asking himself these questions. Raphael twice in his biography, Vasari tells us that Raphael was an amorous man. So this is something that apparently was well known as a matter of fact, in uh, the exhibition on Raphael, in the uh, in the Quirinal, uh, there's a portrait and a, a document that came to light about Raphael's of an illegitimate daughter of Raphael. So we find Raphael told to us, he's told to us that he frequented courtesans, he had girlfriends galore, and to try to give his 
personal life, more structure as well to raise his status, a friend of his, a truly caring friend of his, Cardinal Bibiena, offered him offered in offered his niece's hand in marriage to Raphael. So you see the betrothal Raphael to Maria Antonietta Bibiena. However, Raphael did not actually marry Maria Antonietta Bibiena. He put off the wedding mostly because he was besotted with his mistress, Margarita Luti, also known as the Fornarina, because she was a baker's daughter and clearly not of a stepped out of a position to add to Raphael's status. These two portraits, both in the exhibition, um, both in the exhibition, these two portraits show on the left-hand side, another exquisite portrait. This one dates from the same time as the Baldessari Castiglione portrait, where you see the very limited uh, palette, but the richness of the, the of the fabric, so the silk of her sleeve, that sort of muted agate necklace, the little bright pearl against that mahogany hair and that soft veil, and of course Raphael's signature ability to paint skin, and then a much more intimate portrait, something that clearly was meant for Raphael's own private uh, pleasure, the uh, portrait of uh, Margarita Luti wearing an armband. Uh, with his name on it, which gives a sort of sense of his uh, proprietary relationship. Raphael, I should say, died while this painting was being completed, and the face was actually completed by Giulio Romano, and so that's one of the reasons why you see a harshness in the contours versus the softness on the left. Raphael was singular and unparalleled in painting skin and painting that softness of skin. And I think at the end of the day, uh, in this sort of great dichotomy of Raphael, I think at the end of the day, this painting tells us which direction he ended up taking. The painting of the Transfiguration, he began in 1517, and it was, it, was, it was barely complete in 1520 when he died. It was a work that was yet another competition with Michelangelo. Michelangelo was supposed to paint the uh, Raising of Lazarus, and Raphael was to paint the Transfiguration. This had been arranged by Giuliano de' Medici, the future Pope Clement VII, but Michelangelo refused, and he did not want to uh, compete with Raphael. He didn't feel that it was necessary. So Raphael walked into his studio, and what we now know after many years of study, this painting is in the uh, Vatican Museums, is that uh, Raphael painted the entire thing himself. It took him a long time, he was working on it on the side, but it's very fascinating when you break it down. The painting is divided into two parts. The upper part shows the transfiguration. The lower part shows another story that takes place within and around the transfiguration, where the nine apostles who have not accompanied Jesus to the mountaintop are trying to heal a boy possessed by demons. And they're not very successful at it. And you see in this lower part of the painting a lot of dramatic gesticulation with that wild foreshortening. The foot that extends out, the hand that extends out with the figure on the left with the book. You have the female figure kneeling, turning, the figure like my, that Raphael had already used in the painting of Heliodorus when he was competing with Michelangelo. The boy is suffering from convulsions. His eyes are rolling back in his head. His shocked father doesn't know what to do. There's a lot Lot of drama here. Bright metallic colors, into very choreographed but very powerful movements. But this type of painting, this eye-catching painting, this, this dramatic type of painting, spiritually, what does it lead us to, right? It leads us to basically thinking we should go to the gym more, I tend to think. Then the upper part of the painting shows what Raphael wants to point out. In the image of the Transfiguration, the figures are reduced to basically six with the two patron saints over on the left. Peter, James, and John are, are on the top of the mountain, Elijah and Moses to the left and the right, and every one of them is subordinated to Jesus. Nobody challenges Jesus. Jesus is bigger and brighter. He's not a big muscular figure. He's simply the personification of light. Raphael, who we saw experimenting with chiaroscuro in the liberation of St. Peter, has mastered his manipulation of light and dark so well that he can show you Jesus as a light that has an energy and a power of its own. That white light of Jesus seems to push back clear away the clouds. No darkness can stand before Jesus as he reveals himself as the son of God. 
And that vision of light and the vision of art that's supposed to lead us towards light, towards Christ, towards hope, is a hope what Raphael was carrying in his heart when he died unexpectedly. You can see him changing dramatically from the 25-year-old bright-eyed, bushy-tailed boy who showed up under Julius II to a very overworked man. This is the portrait done in the last year of his life. You see his face is puffy, dark circles under his eyes. It's clear that Raphael has aged very much over the past few years. And he died again unexpectedly and was accompanied to his tomb by all of the city of Rome. Vasari says the entire city turned out. And this painting called A Hundred Torches is a reminder of the other thing Vasari tells us is that a hundred painters in Rome led the funeral procession carrying torches as the body of Raphael was brought to his tomb in the Pantheon. Pietro Bembo, one of the great uh, uh, humanists of the court of Leo X, wrote his epitaph personally, living great nature feared that he would outdo her, and in dying she feared herself to die. And the, the transfiguration painting was placed above his grave, and in the words of Vasari, all of Rome, the, all of Rome's heart burst when they saw the painting so alive over the body dead. For the year of Raphael 2020, the Italian state committed to leaving a red rose every day at Raphael's tomb in the Pantheon. And I'm sorry that you aren't able to hear, you aren't able to hear to see it this year, but I hope you will be back soon and we will have an opportunity to lay a rose at the tomb of Raphael. I hope you'll join us this coming Saturday when we talk about Leonardo. We'll be backtracking in the life of Raphael and seeing how his, his, his interaction with the art of Leonardo da Vinci was so instrumental into turning him into one of the great superstar painters of the Renaissance. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to hearing, to, 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 to meeting you again.